Before I get started with the talk, I just want to thank a few people whose work uh, I'll be presenting here. Um, so uh, everything uh, that you'll see today uh, comes from work done uh, mainly by uh, my PhD students back at MIT. Um, uh, we actually have Alex Liu, uh, some of whose results will be in this talk, who's here in the audience. Uh, and also the uh, engineering team for Metaprob, which is a probabilistic programming language embedded in Clojure that I'll be showing to all of you. Uh, and the tech lead for that team, Zane Shelby, is also uh, somewhere in this room uh, right over there as well. Um, so you can follow up with any of us if you have questions after the talk. Uh, so what I thought I would do today is first try to motivate an approach to AI programming that um, tries to address some of the limitations of mainstream practice in machine learning. So I'll spend a few minutes kind of reviewing what those limitations look like from the lens of, uh, of, of the state of the art in, in academic AI research. Um, then I'll give a brief tour of just a few applications of probabilistic programming. So probabilistic programming uh, may be new to, to many people in this, in this community. It's, a, it's an emerging field that's been growing over the last 10 years. Um, uh, so I'll give uh, a sense of some of the capabilities that are coming online as a result of probabilistic programming. Uh, then I'll spend um, a bit of time going a little bit in depth uh, on one example of a probabilistic program uh, written in Metaprob, which is a probabilistic programming language that we would not have been able to build without all of the hard work from this community because its, it's design exploits many features of Clojure and it's implemented as a lightweight embedding in Clojure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where we see the potential use cases for Metaprob in industry. Um, uh, and then I'll close with a, a, a few words about a new open source engineering project that's principally philanthropically supported that's happening at MIT um, uh, and ways that uh, uh, we're looking for help. Okay. So um, now uh, in, in 2018, uh, near the end of 2018, um, I, th I think it's safe to say that we, we may be sort of reaching or just past the peak about e exuberance uh, around big data. Um, and to get a sense of what that, that arc was, um, I, I often like to remember that 10 years ago, in 2008, the editor-in-chief of Wired uh, had an article titled The End of Theory, so how the data deluge was going to make the scientific method obsolete. Um, and I think, looking back, it's safe to say that that hasn't happened. Um, however, um, I, I think the excitement around big data and machine learning is really keying on some fundamental shifts in computing um, and our relationship, the relationship uh, between our understanding of computation and of knowledge. So let me just sort of try to highlight a little bit kind of the circumstances where the myth in, uh, of big data really can come true to some meaningful extent so that we can also uh, see its limitations a little bit more clearly. So my uh, favorite success story of machine learning from big data is AlphaGo Zero. Um, so AlphaGo, uh, as, as, as many of you may have heard, is an AI system built by Google DeepMind, which uh, has world champion performance at the game of Go. AlphaGo Zero is a version of AlphaGo that was trained entirely on uh, synthetic data. So no human Go games were used as part of the training data for AlphaGo. Instead, uh, AlphaGo played roughly 5 million Go games against itself, um, and that process generated the synthetic data, which um, was used to train or to incrementally update a neural network that was used to provide a heuristic for a very classic search algorithm in sort of the, the old school AI tradition. And it was that architecture that, that led to, to world class performance in Go. So, so it's worth reflecting for a moment on what made AlphaGo Zero possible um, and what that teaches us about the limitations of machine learning. So I think it's helpful to understand that by, by putting out potential applications of machine learning on a spectrum, um, where on one extreme you have a game like Go, where the rules have been fixed for over two millennia and are very easy to simulate on a computer. So that means it's easy to generate a very large amount of synthetic training data for, for a machine learning algorithm. Also, in the game of Go, there's an objective winner and loser for every game. So that actually means that it's easy to generate a training signal, to label the data that you can generate synthetically. And this is the best case scenario for machine learning. And in situations that match that mold, it's a transformative technology. 
Um, but let's now shift to a scenario like autonomous driving. So in autonomous driving, it's much harder to get good data. Um, you can try to use simulators. You know, all the major uh, autonomous driving efforts in industry use simulators and video game technology very heavily. Um, but their accuracy is um, uh, hard, to, hard to characterize, actually. It's hard to know how accurate the simulators really are um, in the dimensions that matter the most for performance of you know, a perception system, let's say, in the real world. Um, and even if you could perfectly simulate a given stretch of road, um, the road conditions vary very, very widely. Um, uh, from hour to hour in some cases. So it's f much harder to get really relevant training data. And uh, drivers and pedestrians have complex and often conflicting objectives. So even if you could simulate the roads you wanted to dry on, dr drive on perfectly, um, it's harder to turn that simulated data into training signals for machine learning. Um, so we, we might expect that it's gonna be harder to to solve machine learning engineering problems, or to solve autonomous driving engineering problems using pure machine learning than it is to, to solve uh, 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 the problem of playing games like Go. And then uh, we can also go to problems like cancer treatment where um, uh, we're so far from being able to generate simulated data or gather real data at the resolution that would be needed and it's extremely unclear um, how to turn the data that we have into unambiguous training signals. Um, so, Yet yeah, we'd like to have software support and really AI support for problems all across this spectrum. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, um, but you do encounter machine learning in your professional roles, let's say, as, as engineers, um, I'd invite you to ask yourself, uh, where along this spectrum does the proposed application of machine learning lie? Is it more like Go? Is it more like autonomous driving? Or is it more like you know, a problem like, like cancer biology? Um, there's another way we can look at the limitations of machine learning. Um, uh, so uh, there, there's an XKCD comic that, that I'm quite fond of uh, where you know, one person says, when a user takes a photo, we, we'd like an app that should check whether they're in a national park. And the other person says, sure, it's easy. Give me a few hours. And then the, the, the feature request is, can we check whether the photo is of a bird? Uh, and then the, uh, the engineer says, I'll need a research team in five years. Um, so this sort of very kind of hard to predict capability surface is actually intimately related to um, ways in which machine learning systems are um, more difficult than ordinary software on dimensions of interpretability, maintainability, verifiability, um, the core engineering considerations. And in fact, that problem is so deep that at Google, many, uh, there was a set of engineering leads who shipped influential machine learning services within the company who went on to write a paper where they called machine learning the high interest credit card of technical debt. Um, so in particular, they, that paper, uh, which, which I encourage you all to read, observes that machine learning can make it easier to ship version zero of a system. Um, but then uh, we'll make it much harder to ship version one relative to if version zero was shipped using more traditional uh, engineering methodology. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Okay, so um, uh, let me talk a little bit about probabilistic programming, which is an emerging programming model um, that aims to address some of these limitations. So I'll mostly do that um, through the lens of uh, inverse graphics. As, as, or I'll first do that through the lens of an application in, in, in inverse graphics. So um, uh, computer vision um, is, uh, can be thought of as the problem of um, going from an image to a symbolic description of, of what's in that image. Um, and there's a very old proposal in computer vision um, that says uh, it, that problem can be uh, formalized as the inverse problem to computer graphics. So computer graphics software can go from symbolic descriptions of scenes to rendered images. So somehow conceptually, the problem that computer vision systems are trying to solve is, is working backwards. Um, taking all of the knowledge that you know, might go into a scene generator and a graphics engine and somehow using that to work backwards from a real image to find out what scene is a, is a good explanation of that image. So here's an example result from a probabilistic program um, uh, that solves a version of this problem. So uh, uh, there's a column here where I'm showing the observed input images of faces. Um, so these are, these are face images. Um, and the question that the probabilistic program is trying to answer is what would this face look like uh, if we rotated it or if we lit the face differently? 
So we could solve this problem if we could infer a 3D model of the face and then apply ordinary graphics operations to that 3D model to rotate it or light it differently. Um, so in each row, I'm showing an input image and then a reconstruction of that input image uh, via using a probabilistic program that implements a kind of inverse graphics. And then I'm showing what happens when we take the 3D model that was used to make the reconstruction and rotate it or light, uh, or light it differently. Um, and we can see that the system works um, in uh, several uh, uh, cases where the face is uh, uh, facing the camera directly and also in cases where the face is rotated to the side. So, you know, um, a, a more challenging case for, for pure pattern recognition approaches. So let's uh, watch a movie of an inference engine that's actually solving this problem. Um, so uh, here in one panel, I'm showing the input face. And then on the right, I'm showing the sequence of reconstructions of that input face that a probabilistic programming system goes through when solving this problem using a particular probabilistic program. So initially, it's making guesses that you know, lead to pretty crazy reconstructions that don't really look that much like the face to our eyes. But then it get, kind of gets into the ballpark and then starts to fine tune the match. So I'll watch that once more. So what you're seeing here is uh, the, the running execution of, of, a, of a probabilistic program um, that uses some existing machine learning techniques to make those initial guesses, uh, but then does something else. And over the course of this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of much simpler examples of that something else uh, so that you can get a sense of what the nuts and bolts are. Um, but the machine learning is used to go from the face image to a very rough guess, and then, it's fine, then, then the, the match is fine-tuned using probabilistic programming. Okay, so here's the structure of the probabilistic program. The, the core of the probabilistic program is something called a generative model. And again, I'll show some examples in closure later on in the talk. Here I'm just showing uh, 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 some earlier examples um, uh, 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 that happen to be embedded in Julia. Um, so uh, the, prob the structure of the probabilistic program we use to solve this problem starts with a scene generator, which is a little block of code that generates a random texture map, face mesh, and then chooses random coordinates for a camera position and, and a light source. So that constitutes a scene. Then that's fed into an ordinary renderer, uh, which produces a, a face. Now somehow in the inference task, our, our goal is going to be to take some image data from the world and uh, try to reconstruct it by this rendering process. But um, if, we, if we just have uh, uh, the, uh, but, but, but the core of, of our solution is a generative model, which is code which um, if run forwards, just generates random faces at different orientations with different lighting conditions. Okay, so this is one. So, so one core piece of, of a probabilistic program is a structured model of the world using ordinary code uh, that makes stochastic choices for unknown elements, like what exactly is the face mesh, or what's the texture map, or what's the lighting and orientation. And that code, if run if run forwards, generates, uh, if you like, synthetic data. Um, uh, and now the, there's a challenge, which is how can one use that to somehow work backwards from a real image? I'll, I'll show some examples of that later. Um, but in any case, uh, the code to do that synthetic data generation and to do inference fits in about a page of Julia in this probabilistic programming language called Picture. So that's one application of probabilistic programming. Uh, but let me show uh, another application of probabilistic programming. Um, so here's one uh, where our goal is to analyze experimental data from synthetic biology lab experiments um, because we want to be able to screen experimental data for errors or estimate uh, the likely variability of a new lab experiment before performing it. Um, so there, there's an experiment that's happening in the world which produces very, very sparse experimental data. In this case, maybe only a, a, you can think of it as a spreadsheet with a couple hundred rows. So far too little data to apply machine learning techniques, especially modern deep learning techniques. Um, and so somehow what we want to do is go from that data to a virtual experiment simulator, which is some piece of code which simulates likely experimental outcomes. Um, so that then we can answer all sorts of what-if questions about the probable outcomes of experiments we haven't performed yet. And in fact, it, it turns out it's possible to solve that problem. Um, our solution uses Metaprob, the language that I'm going to go into uh, in, the, in the second half of the, the talk, 
Um, uh, and here I'm just showing an, an example result um, uh, where uh, I'm showing two scatter plots um, that are each taking uh, particular pairs of variables from this synthetic biology data set. Um, and in blue, I'm showing the simulated data from the probabilistic program that models the experimental results. And in red, I'm showing the real data from the actual lab experiment. Um, uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a good match between the two, um, which is really just meant to show that uh, if we can build these probabilistic programs from data, we can then use them as proxies. And those proxies work even in cases that are sort of where, where, where the data is a, a bit unlikely, like where there are these funny patterns of noise or little clusters of outliers. Um, what you can see on the bottom of the slide is that we're using a SQL-like query language to ask questions of these probabilistic programs. Um, so some of you um, in the audience may have uh, encountered a system called BayesDB. Um, so this, this result is, is, a, is a result from, from, from BayesDB, which is a probabilistic programming platform that's designed to interface closely with databases and let people ask questions uh, using an SQL-like query language. Um, so in particular, to, to query the virtual experiment, you use a simulate keyword, which acts a lot like a select keyword in a database, except it's querying um, uh, the model, the probabilistic program, which can generate simulated data instead of the real data. Um, and uh, here's a uh, code for that simulator. Um, uh, and uh, as, as you'll see, it's, it's in actually this, uh, it's in Metaprob, which is a, a lightweight embedding into Clojure. Um, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll go through some examples later. But as compared to machine learning technology, um, the key point is that although this code was written by an algorithm, uh, unlike the weights of a neural net, the code is editable by human programmers and can be checked um, by domain experts. Um, so we're starting to see some evidence that it's possible to go from sparse structured data to models that are represented as code um, uh, that can then be refined uh, by human experts um, and then used to solve various data analysis problems. Um, and the, the pipeline for doing this, which involves starting from a database, uh, uh, or the, or the, the pipeline for doing this starts from a sparse database, uses techniques uh, um, uh, that we're calling Bayesian synthesis techniques for producing probabilistic programs that model the data. Um, and then uh, those probabilistic programs get fed into a probabilistic programming system, uh, which takes uh, uh, user-specified questions and then produces probabilistic answers about what, you know, what outcomes are likely under various conditions. Um, and there's a series of papers that describe all the technical details for this, um, including one uh, in uh, uh, in the Principles of Programming Languages conference. Uh, so it'll be appearing next year, but it's on the internet now. Um, so all the, all the, sort of the math and the algorithms are, 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 um, are publicly available. Um, and this community, um, with its programming languages orientation, might actually find that last paper from the Principles of Programming Languages uh, particularly interesting, because um, we talk about uh, learning programs in domain-specific probabilistic programming languages um, that all have nice embeddings into, into um, uh, uh, programming frameworks like, like Clojure. Okay, um, so let me just mention a third example application, um, uh, which is very new work in progress by my student Alex um, and one of his collaborators, uh, uh, Monica Agarwal. Um, so uh, the idea here is to use probabilistic programming to write short probabilistic scripts that make it easier to answer questions from dirty data. Um, and I encourage you to talk to Alex if you have example databases that you've encountered you know, in your professional lives where something like this might be useful. Um, uh, my lab has uh, helped get a couple of startups started over the years that have both become part of large business analytics companies like Salesforce and, and Tableau, um, which sort of motivated our thinking about this problem. But we're very interested in current uh, examples from the, uh, from the, the experience of, of closure programmers. Um, but so the, the, the problem is, one problem is that databases may, 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 may contain messy or incomplete data. So if you have you know, a fraction of data from an apartment listing website, some of the records maybe are missing the city or the state. But of course, a, a person looking at that can infer probable values for a lot of the missing ones just by using their common sense knowledge. So that naturally raises the question, is it possible to make a smarter database that can actually perform common sense inferences to fill in the blanks or detect cells in a database that might be probably uh, 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 erroneous? Um, and I think um, there's some evidence that this is actually possible. Um, and my personal hunch is that this will become practical over the next couple years. Um, 
Uh, so Alex has prototyped a system um, which lets you uh, run queries where you um, uh, run a, a SQL-like query, but you can use this funny infer inferring keyword um, to have the database uh, hand you back results that come from a probabilistic program um, that was applied to the rows of the database to fill in the blanks. Um, and the probabilistic program can inc include knowledge about how cities and states relate, um, or you know, what are the mean rents in different cities or different states, or what are typos that often show up when you enter a city name, and stitch together all of those probabilistic models behind the scenes. Um, it's quite analogous to how a database query engine does a lot of work to search the data efficiently, only here we're automatically stitching together little models to fill in the blanks or detect errors uh, 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 behind an SQL-like interface. Um, and again, some of these ideas were in a version, uh, early versions of the BaseDB platform, um, uh, uh, but, I, but, but I think we have a lot farther to, farther to go. Um, okay, so that's a third application. All right, so uh, I'm about uh, halfway through my time, um, and uh, just to, to remind everybody where we are, I've tried to motivate um, the need to go beyond machine learning um, to address emerging AI programming needs. And I've just tried to give you a teaser of a couple of the applications of probabilistic programming that have been coming online over the last few years. Um, I should say uh, one more thing about that before we, 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 we go into Metaprob. So probabilistic programming has emerged over the last 10 years, uh, primarily at universities such as MIT, uh, where my group is, Stanford and Berkeley, but um, there are now probabilistic programming teams at Google, uh, at uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Uber, um, a couple of startups, um, in addition to the startups that, that I was involved in. Um, so I would say that you know, it's still early in terms of industry uptake, um, uh, but we just had the first international conference on probabilistic programming at MIT. Um, if you Google for it, you can find it. Uh, there are talks on YouTube from that conference um, where you can see industry use cases and uh, academic research. And there are probably you know, maybe 15 or so uh, open source probabilistic programming platforms uh, uh, that were presented at that conference, including the ones that, that came from my lab, which are only three of them. Um, so I'd say the area is early, but sort of growing. Um, and I think there's still a chance to have a big, big influence in how the community unfolds uh, for people who, um, who, who start to learn and, and participate now. So uh, let me uh, spend a little while on uh, Metaprob, which is uh, a particular probabilistic programming language I'm excited about um, because it's, uh, uh, it reflects the values and aesthetics of the Lisp community. Um, which was actually uh, my home community growing up. So I had the privilege of studying from Jerry Sussman and Hal Abelson and other people who helped shape the evolution of Lisp and Scheme in the early days. And my hope is that some of that, uh, some of that, uh, some of those values and aesthetics are, are reflected in the design of Metaprob. So uh, let me use a, a, a problem uh, again to, to motivate Metaprob. So um, here I'm showing four data sets on the XY plane. Um, uh, so can everybody just use their finger to draw in the air what curve they think fits these data sets? So what about the first one? Great, okay, line. What about the second one? Okay, great. So almost everybody went like this, but then a couple of people like kind of smiled and went like this, right? And they didn't just like go like this, but they sort of, they knew they were making a joke, right? Okay, so what about the next one? Okay, right, maybe some problem. And what about the last one? Cool, okay. So what's happened here is we've all done something quite effortlessly, which is quite remarkable, actually, from a statistical standpoint. We've looked at data, we've figured out not just the parameters of a model, but even what type of model it is. Like, is it a linear function, a quadratic function? And we made judgment calls to rule out certain data points as probably outliers. Right, so this is very different than just like training on labeled examples. Somehow our mind has very quickly shifted through a very large space of explanations to converge on probable ones that are largely in agreement you know, uh, around this room. Um, so uh, you know, uh, XKCD, uh, again, kind of has a great comic about this problem. Um, uh, you know, the, the debates around curve fitting um, can get quite contentious. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> And um, you can see that if all you do is fit curves to data from a simple family of parametric models, it's easy to get crazy results that make no sense. But somehow that's not what our minds did, right? Our minds did something smarter than all the methods that are talked about in this XKCD comic. So let's see if we can write a probabilistic program that um, uh, uh, works a little bit more like we do. 
So um, uh, here uh, I'm going to define a generative model uh, in Metaprob. Um, uh, which is a lightweight embedded language uh, embedded in Clojure. Um, uh, gen, you can think of this gen keyword here as a lot like lambda or fn, you know, it's introducing a procedure, but it's a, a generative procedure. So this procedure curve model takes some x's and uh, maps a curve across those x's. And that curve is, ge is generated by, well, generating a random curve and adding noise to it. So if we run this curve model on a vector of inputs, negative 3, 0, 2, 3, let's say, uh, we might get some y values out the other end. So this is a synthetic data generator. The implementation of generate curve um, uh, chooses a, a random degree for a polynomial, then generates coefficients at random based on that degree, and then evaluates a polynomial function uh, at some input point x whatever one was randomly generated. And then the function that adds noise to a curve takes a curve, represented as, as a little program, um, and then uh, uh, m decides whether a given input point returns a procedure, uh, which takes a function x, uh, decides whether x is an outlier or not. Um, and if it is, uh, generates a draw from a Gaussian with zero mean and standard deviation five, and otherwise generates a draw from a Gaussian whose mean is the value of the curve at that input point x, that's that curve x form, and then uh, and, uh, standard deviation one. So uh, one of the things Metaprob lets a user do is record the trace of this procedure. So let me just explain that concept by, by illustrating it on this example. So I can you know, ask, uh, ask the REPL to pretty print the trace of this curve model when run on inputs negative, the, the list negative three, zero, two, three. And what I get out is this data structure here, this collection of nested maps, which store all of the stochastic choices that curve model made when you ran it. So that includes things like what was the degree, what were the coefficients, uh, were outliers enabled? Um, uh, and then what were the values of the outlier variables for each input x? And then what were the values drawn from all the Gaussian distributions for those input x's? So you can see that as a map. This is basically a, 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 a value that, that, that represents the behavior of the curve model procedure. So if I were to make this into a slogan uh, from sort of a lispy perspective, I might say in Metaprob, uh, as in Clojure, code is data but also representations of the runtime behavior of code are data. Um, and they're stored in these traces. Um, and I'm also showing a graphic that uh, gives you an image of the trace of that code. And if I run it again, because this curve model makes stochastic choices, I'm going to get a different trace and a different curve. So maybe this time I get a line with very different y values. Now, I can uh, do inference in this problem as follows. So let me make some y data points. So in this case, I'm going to make y's, which is going to store uh, 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 store the value zero. So I'm going to be analyzing a data a data set which just has a single x y uh, a single pair uh, x y where x is 0 and y is 0. And I'm going to use a helper function to make a little trace that just represents that, con that uh, single data point as a constraint. And then uh, I can, uh, if I print that back, uh, that's that third line. Uh, so if I print that observation trace, I, I see this little fragmentary trace, which is just saying that uh, 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 the, there was a single data point, and the Gaussian draw associated with that data point took on the value zero. Um, now, once I've built that up, I can use another procedure that Metaprob provides called infer. So infer is like trace, but instead of just recording the trace of the input procedure, infer actually does inference. So it takes a curve model and some inputs and a trace that represents constraints to satisfy. So in this case, a set of data to match. And it tries to return a trace that's consistent with the observations that were given. So in this case, 
uh, with this one XY data point, all it has to do is find an execution of curve model, which is consistent with uh, when X is zero, Y happened to be zero. So on this particular run, we get a line. We happen to get a line. But if I run it again, maybe I get a different curve, uh, you know, that, like a parabola, which goes kind of near that point, zero, zero. So I've taken closure, and I've added two concepts, one tracing, and the second one is inference, where tracing takes a piece of code and records its behavior, and then inference takes a piece of code and possibly a partial set of constraints on the behavior of the program and tries to find an execution that satisfies it. I mean, this is conceptually um, kind of analogous in some ways to, uh, say, core logic in Clojure, except for a much uh, broader class of models and operations, which can be defined by uh, 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 probability theory and, and approximate inference. And I can do the same thing with four xy points. So here I have uh, uh, y's now being a, a collection of four points. And I can make a trace out of, that represents those. And I can say I'd like to do inference in my curve model with input x's and those y's. Um, and maybe I get a curve that uh, 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 looks like a line that, that, that goes very nearly through all those data points. So if I run this on the problems I showed earlier, uh, here are the results I get. So I get, it does a reasonable job on the line maybe, but um, on, the, on the, the example with the outliers, you can see that there's a spread, which is a bit high. Like it's sort of plausible, it does say those two points are outliers, you know, but there's a lot of spread. Um, and for the other examples, the results I don't think look so good. Okay, so what went wrong? Well, it turns out that if we just run a whole bunch of traces, we can see how our modeling assumptions are a little bit bogus. In particular, here I'm just showing 16 traces where I've put in inputs, you know, a whole lot of x's so you can get a sense of y's all along the curve. And what you can see are all these curves are pretty noisy. In fact, much noisier than these, at least in our mind's eye. Right? So our modeling assumptions were wrong. Well, uh, well, we can change that. We can change the add noise to curve procedure uh, by adding the highlighted lines I'm showing here, which make the inlier noise, outlier noise, and the probability that a data point's an outlier uh, stochastic choices with some prior distribution. So now those are unknown variables that we're going to infer as well. And this new model has a slightly larger trace which doesn't just include a curve, but it also includes these bands around the curve for inliers and outliers. So we've made a more complex model that can make judgment calls about how noisy the data is. When we run that model, we get the results on the bottom row, where for this data point, it's extremely confident it's a line that very closely matches the data. Then for the second data set, it's extremely confident that's a line and these two are outliers. For this data set, it's extremely confident that it's a, par a parabola and that this data point's an outlier. Although for this one, it's still not sure is it a curve or is it a line, but it is very sure that this data point out here is an outlier, okay? Um, so this is just meant to be a microcosm example of probabilistic programming where we wrote down some modeling assumptions using code um, and uh, we understand the way we do that is by um, defining models over the possible executions of a piece of code, and then using some inference engine to take that model and some constraints and, and work backwards. Um, and you, you can kind of get a sense of why we might expect this to work, uh, where if we generate 16 traces from the model that had inference over the level of noise, we can see that there's lots of curves now that have much less noise as compared to the curves on the, on, on the left. So that's sort of the thing we fixed uh, by making that small change to the piece of code. Okay? So of course, one key question you may be asking is, how do you implement infer? <laughs> Um, and uh, my time's almost up, <laughs> um, uh, but um, I, I, you know, I, I can understand that, that what it's doing can seem a bit mysterious. So I mean, here's a movie of it, of it operating on the, on the curve model um, where we can see it exploring the space of curves and kind of adjusting the noise levels and some of the data points kind of flicker on and off as to being outliers or not. 
Um, this is kind of like the face example I was showing you earlier. Um, but the key point uh, is that it's not magic. <laughs> Um, uh, there's actually a metaprogramming concept there that I'm not showing you. So there's a default inference engine, which uses some algorithms, but there's a whole programming model um, for how do you control the exploration of these space of traces using a whole bunch of techniques that you can talk about the soundness of. Um, and there's some papers online that, that talk about that type of inference metaprogramming. Um, uh, so um, uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the papers and contact us. Um, okay. Um, and this is important because if we want this to work across many different fields, from statistics to robotics to machine learning, we need to be able to write down models from all of those fields, but also the essential nature of the approximation algorithms that are used in all those fields. Um, and that's what the programming model inside this infer construct uh, is designed to, to make possible. Okay, so um, let me wrap up by, by sharing a little bit about what we're doing at MIT and, and, and how you can help. So, uh, if you're interested. So um, first, we're building a new modeling and inference stack, which includes several probabilistic programming languages. So one of them is really designed for combining uh, models as code with neural nets and optimization algorithms. Um, that one's called Gen. There's a second one called BaseDB, which is designed for searching databases, uh, DevOps for data type use cases, like screening data for errors. Um, both the startups that came out of my lab were based on the BaseDB technology path. Um, uh, and also making data science much more accessible by building spreadsheet interfaces on top of this stuff um, that we can use to, to, teach, uh, to teach people who are, are, are maybe less comfortable with programming. Uh, BaseDB is actually being implemented on top of Metaprob, which is this lightweight embedded probabilistic programming language enclosure. Um, and then all of that uh, is um, getting uh, built on top of a cloud platform, uh, which I can talk about with people who are interested. Um, so you can email me if you're interested maybe in field testing this stuff next year. Um, as I mentioned, this is all uh, uh, primarily supported by philanthropists um, who are interested in seeing uh, civic engagement on the basis of these applications, um, as well as tech transfer to industry through entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, we're growing the engineering team. Um, so we're looking for um, engineering leads, uh, software engineers for Metaprob. So it's a language engineering project. Um, uh, and BaseDB. Um, uh, we're looking for an engineering manager, um, and we're actively working to build a diverse team. Um, so we really want to encourage women and members of other underrepresented communities to apply. Um, uh, and if you're interested, uh, you could email me, vkm at mit.edu, and Zane Shelby, our tech lead who's here, um, uh, or talk to us afterwards. Okay. Any questions?